Hey everyone, it's Leslie with Tier 1 Jank. Thanks for joining me today. Today I have a janky build to share with you. Uh, this was my half of the two-headed giant build that Marcus and I put together for pre-release weekend. First, I do want to say two-headed giant is absolutely my most favorite event to go to on a pre-release weekend. So if you've never been to a two-headed giant, we each had our own deck, uh, 40 cards still. We shared a lot of the parts of Magic, the game, the combat step, um, really each of the phases, and we shared uh, the draw step, untapping, all of that stuff. The only thing that we didn't share was our mana pool. Um, we also shared our life count, and we were able to target each other's creatures to do some really cool things. So stick around today. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about some of the key pieces that I had in this deck, how the synergies kind of work between them and a really cool thing that happened we were able to use sure strike as a almost like a board wipe so that was pretty cool so i want to talk a little bit about that today too so first on the left side of the screen over here i have the key pieces in this deck these were the key players that did the most work for us in this deck so um to start with niv mizzet this is a six drop, three blue, three red. This guy here can't be countered. That was pretty awesome. He's a big guy. And whenever um, I drew a card, he dealt a point of damage to any target. And then also whenever anyone cast an instant or a sorcery, I got to draw a card. So he really did a lot of work for us. I was really uh, glad that we pulled that one copy of that. Additionally, Goblin uh, Electromancer was another big piece of this. I know that he's a kind of a tiny guy, but he really made it possible for us to do a lot in a turn because I could cast more than one instant or sorcery in, in some cases because I was able to save that mana. The other card that really was a key player for us was Hypothesis. And this kind of looks like it's a little bit expensive at a five drop. It does draw two cards and then you may discard a non-land card. And when you do, Hypothesis will deal four damage to target creature. So there were some times when we would use this to just draw two cards because the cards that we drew and that we had in hand, or that I did, I should say, uh, were cards that we didn't want to get rid of. So it seemed like a little bit high cost for that. But because of this, we were really able to um, get some triggers off of Niz, um, or Niv Mizzet, uh, get some cards in hand that we really needed, and in some cases do uh, enough damage to destroy a creature and get it off the board. So those were our key pieces in this. Everything else was kind of built to work around them. And one thing that was really nice about this particular set, uh, this time around with pre-release anyways, is because of Guilds of Ravnica, I felt like it was a lot easier to come up with the colors that would work best together. So we already knew that red and blue, going that is it build was gonna work well, so that's what we did with this one. So to get some of those triggers going here or be able to use Goblin Electromancers, um, make spells cost one less ability, we did put a good chunk of instants and sorceries into the build. Um, so including Hypothesis and the sorceries and instants that are here, we had 10 total, which if you think about it in a 40 card deck, that's quite a bit of the deck. That's 25% of the deck. So this is definitely a very mid-range field deck. We used a lot of these for removal and um, to kind of help us keep a tempo going with the game too. So the Lava Coils, the Selective Snare, those um, kind of act as removal for us. The Sonic Assault, even though it wasn't actually taking a creature off the board, we did have it in there so that if we needed to, we could tap a creature and make it so that it wasn't a threat to us if we were trying to swing in for more damage or even to finish out a game. The Sure Strike and max Maximize Velocity were in here just to be a little bit of a battle trick. Um, the Sure Strike, so I'll talk a little bit about that story. This one turned out to be perfect timing. We had a guy on the other side, a little creature of Marcus's that had death touch and it required everyone to block it that could when it attacked. So 
we had one person out that was a defender and because of one of the creatures I had, it wasn't able to block, but everything else was able to block it. And I played the sure strike uh, targeting his creature before any damage was done. And we were able to get rid of four or five different creatures that were blocking it because of that death touch and only needing to do one point of damage to each of those creatures. So that was really cool. We were able to keep his guy, have my guys out on the board still, swing in for quite a bit of damage and get rid of all of the creatures on their side. So it was really neat to see uh, just a little common like sure strike do a lot of work for us. The other two instants that are here are, uh, well this one is two in that one card so you can cast either or, not both, either or. So expansion, explosion. Expansion allows you to copy a target instant or sorcery spell with converted mana cost four or less and you may choose a new target or new target for the copy. This one was actually fit well into the deck because aside from Hypothesis, everything else in here it could copy if it needed to. And Explosion uh, is a two red, two blue, and pay one X, so for every X, it would deal X damage to any target target player draws X cards. So not only was this really helpful for doing some direct damage and being able, a little bit versatile in the amount we could do, it was also drawing us cards. So synergistic wise, that was working really well with niv -Mizza if he was out, um, being able to do that extra point of damage. And there was actually one game where this ended up being a finisher for us because our Goblin Electromancer was out and we were able to pay five, but cast for six cost for X um, because Goblin Electromancer made it cost one less and do the last six points of damage that we needed to to our uh, opposing team in order to win the game. Devious Cover-Up was also, a, a, I would say, one of prob probably one of the most key um, instants in the deck because it really helped us to keep stuff that we were putting into our graveyard in our deck so that we could use it. So if we lost Niv-Mizzet for some reason or if we needed to draw some more cards and put Hypothesis back in, we could do that. In addition to that, we were countering one of their spells, um, so keeping a threat off of the board, and even more so putting in an exile so that if it was something they could reanimate or something like that, they or jumpstart, they couldn't bring it back out. So those were the instants and sorceries. Um, of course, casting those worked really well with niv -Mizzet because casting one would draw us a card and do a point of damage. Additionally, if we had Goblin Electromancer out at the same time, we could cast more if we had more than one in our hand uh, and not very much mana open because he would make each of those cost one less. So moving on to the creature side of things, and um, I do wanna explain a little bit. I put these in some piles here because when I do deck building, um, I kind of do it a little bit funny at least I think I do. When I first started playing Magic, creatures were kind of tough for me. And it took a little while to really understand how to determine what the value of a creature was. And so kind of a strategy that I use to help me with that is to first lay everything out by its mana cost, get my, my numbers down the way that I want. And then I like to put everything in a pile according to what it does for me in that particular deck. So I have a pile here of some guys that um, kind of acted as a little bit of an additional um, damage insurance during combat. So they would either make it so that a creature couldn't block or do a point of damage. Um, this Ornery Goblin would do a point of damage when it was blocked, so that would trigger it. And that really helped to, just for a couple mana cost, um, do a little bit of extra at the beginning of the game or even in the middle of it, help us get through for a little bit more damage because it was keeping things from blocking us. This Goblin Locksmith is the one that kept anything with Defender from blocking us. And even if there wasn't anything out, he was still two power coming through. This pile over here was really helpful for us because it helped with card selection. All of these had Surveil. Um, so this Night Veil Sprite had Flying and Surveil won every time it attacked. So that one we definitely got some value off of because we were able to Surveil more than one time from this guy. 
This Whisper Agent, I actually put in here, I know it's a demure colored card, but because we have the blue in here and that flash is just so awesome for combat, especially when you're swinging, if, when your opponents are swinging in and you want to flash in so you have a blocker, but you didn't want to bring them in too soon so they can't get rid of them. I love flash. So I, I put this in here for that, but he also would surveil one when they come into the battlefield. The Demir Informant um, also did uh, surveil, but it was two, and the Watcher in the Mist was surveil two as well. And some of those were pretty good bodies for us also. Um, the Whisper Agent at 3-2 was usually able to block a fairly decent sized creature, kill it, um, get it off of the board, and they you weren't expecting that coming. And then the Watcher in the Mist was a good body at 3-4 and flying. And then the last pile of creatures that I have here really worked synergistically with the instants and sorceries too. So I wanted to get as much use out of those instants and sorceries as we could, not only from Niv being able to draw us cards, being able to cast several of them in one turn if we needed to, uh, or if we uh, had the mana open with Goblin Electromancer making them cost a little bit less, it was easier to do. But we also used them to help our creatures be better. So um, the first one that's here is Crackling Drake. This one is the one that its power is determined by the number of instants and sorceries that are in both your graveyard and exile. And it also draws a card when it comes into play. So even though this wasn't, I wouldn't say this was a heavy hitter in the game. Um, once it was out, if it was a big body, that was awesome, but it didn't really do much else for us after that but it was really nice to have that creature be able to work with that instant uh, and sorcery kind of synergy there. The one thing that we had to watch with this is if we played it turn five or turn six and we only had a few instants of sorceries in the graveyard and then we put a couple of them back in with devious cover-up, we were lowering that power level there. This next one is a Piston Fist Cyclops. This is a four three body for three mana. And it does have Defender, but even so, as a Defender, that's a great blocker. The part that worked with the Instants and Sorceries was as long as you've cast an Instant or Sorcery, this particular creature can attack as though it didn't have Defender. So we had a three drop that a lot of times was coming in for four, which is a pretty good sized body early in the game. So that was really helpful for us as well. And then Fire Urchin, in a similar fashion, whenever we would cast an Instant or Sorcery, it would get one zero until the end of turn. So if we had done a couple in a turn, we were actually able to beef that up quite a bit. And at only two mana to play it, it wasn't that bad of a little creature for us out on the field. So the last card I have here is the Is It Locket. And this was really helpful too because of the additional mana that it gave us. And it also made it so that if we needed to be on point with our colors, for Niv Mizzet, um, in order to cast him, we were able to do that with that. It almost acted like a dual tap land for us, or a dual land for us. And then the pay for and draw two cards was really nice as well, especially if we had Niv out. So this was the setup for the deck. It worked really well, surprisingly, with Marcus's Golgari build. And um, we kind of talked about it a little bit. We kind of felt like because both of them were able to kind of hold their own, they seemed to work really well together and really helped us to, to do well at pre-release. So next up, we're going to take these head to head. So the next video you come back to watch is gonna be these going um, to, against each other, which I know that we played them side by side at the two headed giant, but we did want you to kind of see some of the mechanics and how they worked and why some of the cards really were good for the each of these decks. So we're gonna do that for you. That's also kind of become a theme for us to do a head-to-head -head battle with our decks. So we hope you'll join us again, and thanks for watching us at Tier 1 Jink.